Welcome to Alberta's Regiment, Stories from the South Alberta Light Horse. I'm Captain Don Gerling, Canadian Army Reserve CIC, and with me today I have Lieutenant Colonel Retired Robert McKenzie. It's my honor that uh, both of us are going to interview today Major Retired Paul Mast. Welcome, Paul. Nice to be here, Don. So, Paul, uh, we have many connections, but uh, uh, from my side, I knew your dad before I knew you as my staff sergeant in the police, police world. And uh, when I read your bio, it was interesting to see uh, some of the things that uh, I learned about you. And your career started at the tender age of 13. That's correct, right? In the, uh, the local cadet, Army Cadet Corps here that was located at Patterson Armories, I guess it was the South Alberta Light Horse Army mm -hmm. Cadet Corps, 13. Um, not really sure, I just started in cadets and uh, went on from there. Uh, I'm not really sure what compelled me to join cadets, but I thought it was a good thing. And I guess probably had some friends at that age and uh, they were involved and so forth. And I got in, started in it and enjoyed it and uh, been involved in the military ever since. So back in those days, you could actually at 16 join the Army Reserve, is that right? That's correct. And you actually were in both the cadets and the reserve at the same time, as I understand it. Yeah, when I, uh, I went from 13 through to, yeah, well, I guess 16. At that time, I was in both uh, both organizations. Although I think the the reserve regiment here sort of they went along with it, but they weren't really keen on on that. So I, I did step back from Army cadets at about age sixteen, and then uh, and, and continued on with the reserve regiment here. Right. So when was your first uh, major course through the reserves that you would have taken your basic training, and where did you take that? Um, we started off as, uh, I believe it was recruit training, um, and then followed by the basic recruit course, which was basically where, you know, how to wear a uniform and do your boots and keep your brass shiny and that type of thing. And then they went into what they call the National um, de uh, Defense Program, Survival. National Survival Course, right, Robert? Yeah. Uh, and that was tied in with the uh, concern about uh, nuclear war, of course, which was a real th uh, potential threat at those days. So. Um, you took your, like I say, your recruit training, and then you went into about, I think it was at least a full year of national survival training, and you could, uh, we learned, you know, first aid, um, had, did wonderful things with ropes, uh, you know, uh, stretcher work, um, uh, clearing uh, uh, people out of uh, uh, places that had been perhaps blast damaged and that type of thing. We had a major exercise up uh, when we were going up to Camp CRC, which is up at Wainwright, or at Calgary. And um, there was a, a, a mock town that had been uh, hit by a nuclear blast. And it was called Gregsville. And we went in there uh, two or three days prior to actually deploying to the field with you know, our armored training. But there was about a three-day exercise where you went into a, a situation where there had been a nuclear disaster. And you had to go and uh, do monitoring for radiation and that sort of thing and contamination, uh, working your way towards the actual uh, da damaged town, if you will, and then you went in there and found all sorts of casualties and, and uh, this sort of thing, and you had to render first aid, uh, do the whole business with uh, triage training and, and that sort of thing, and get people out of uh, hazardous situations. And that went on for at least two to three days. You know, they, they mobilized all the regiments in, in Alberta, pretty much, to be there, certainly southern Alberta, and then you converged on, uh, I think we set up at uh, High River, and then from there worked our way into Calgary, this is Gregsville, which is in the Camp CRC. So that was a, a culmination, if you will, of all the training you did locally uh, in uh, national survival. And it was very realistically and, and, and very well done. So, and then, pra and then following that, uh, ended the ex that particular exercise, then we deployed out in the field under canvas with uh, the tanks and the radio sets and all that sort of thing as part of the armor training. So it was, uh, it was a good stint, yeah. For a lot of people, they wouldn't remember that, but I think I remember growing up still having the air raid sirens going off and you had oh, to for sure. underneath your desk and all of the different protocols that they ta taught to, to us as, as yeah, it was, it was take It was a very real threat at that time, and it was, uh, you know, you, now that you think about it, it was uh, pretty disconcerting when you think what the government was faced with the potential of, of a disaster, national disaster. So it was part and partial of uh, your training. It was just, and then from there, after that particular national surviving training, then you went on to your various trades courses, uh, which you could take driver, uh, wheel driver courses, or gunnery, or uh, which would be your 
tank uh, firing and so forth. And then there was your tank driving and motor mechanics and uh, signals and all that sort of thing. What, what was your specialty, Paul? I think it went into uh, signals. I took uh, blocks one and two of uh, signals under, I think it was old Sergeant Major Honey, I think, at yeah. that time. And we ran, uh, we were using the old 19 sets, which were Second World War vintage radio sets that were uh, still quite usable and actually a very good radio set. Um, the course was extensive and the fact that if you could run that particular radio, uh, you could run just about any radio uh, that the military had at that time. And it seems to me about the time there was kind of a transition between the old 19 sets, which the uh, militia had, and then they were bringing in, I think, the 42 set, which was just the next one beyond the 19 set. And we took that uh, signals course and we got really, really good at it. Um, in fact, I remember sitting, you'd be in the classroom, you'd be fooling around with your 19 set and you'd be picking up uh, 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 radio stuff from yeah. Russia. The sets oh. were that good and, and really were quite remarkable. And we still have a few in the museum here, but they, uh, they were heavy, big, heavy things. And, I remember putting them inside the tanks, which was quite an operation because, you know, you're young and uh, I mean, you're in pretty good shape and so forth, but those, those things were heavy and wrestling them in, getting them inside the, uh, the turret area of a tank and so forth. So, but uh, they, were, they were a good set. And like I say, the, uh, quite enjoyable. I enjoyed the signals portion of my, my training, yeah. But I remember getting uh, them in there and getting everything tuned in, netted in, and then move 10 feet and nobody could talk to anybody. I remember that exactly <laughs> happened to me. Uh, I was given the task of getting uh, the, the four or five tanks that we had in our troop uh, ready for the officers to go out on a tactical exercise, if you will. So Sergeant Major Hundy told me, get over there, Bass, and get those radio sets and take your crew and get over there. And exactly. Get them all netted in, they're just perfect. And those tanks didn't move 50 feet and they came off frequency. Well, needless to say, the Sergeant Major was uh, a little irate, but I was rescued by one of the officers who had witnessed what happened, came to my rescue. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd been on KP, KP duty for some time anyway, but it was, that was an experience, yeah. Was that back in the, in the Sherman tank? Yeah, that was that back time? in about 60, I guess about 65, I guess I joined in 60, no, I joined in 63. So around 1964, 65, yeah, the old Shermans. They're a wonderful uh, tank for reserves and stuff. There were lots of life left in them from the Second War and easy to maintain. They're quite a simple tank, yeah. but, and, they, and the fellows that uh, like to drive them and so forth, and they were, we'd take them out to Suffield and do, you know, uh, gunnery work from them and uh, all that sort of thing. And yeah, they were a good, good piece of kit. When did you take your senior in the course? Senior or junior? Are you junior and senior? Yeah, I took my junior in, uh, I believe it was 1965, I believe, mm. and uh, did quite well there, got up to, uh, Wainwright, in fact, no, it was before 65. It was, I joined in 62, 63, must have been 64. Anyway, got up there with the, uh, the other soldiers at, at Wainwright and uh, I did very well, actually. In fact, I ended up being the top uh, junior NCO in uh, Alberta, which really surprised me at the end of the course, but I must have done something right. And, and, uh, mm -hmm. and that went, uh, so I was very proud of that, actually. And then senior NCO training, um, I can't remember. I, after that, I was promoted to corporal, and then uh, with more a couple more years, and they, they made me a, a, what they call a lance sergeant, which was uh, you wore the sergeant rank, but you weren't quite qualified to be a sergeant. And then from there, I went from uh, actually I don't remember taking a senior in course. Okay. I don't think I did, because right after that, it was then they, they were chasing me down to uh, look about uh, going and getting my commission uh, to be an officer. No, I remember when I joined, uh, you were a sergeant yeah, then, right. in 65. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. And then, as I say, one of the squadron commanders must have gone after, a, a, I think it was a fellow named Bill Onslow. And Bill was a lieutenant, I think, at the time. And uh, he chased me down faithfully every Saturday, coming after me that I'd consider taking my, uh, mm -hmm. going for a commission to be an officer. And I, I would I'd go out of my way to avoid him, <laughs> but he'd always catch me. And they finally wore me down, and I had decided to take my, go for my commission to be an officer at that time. And I haven't regretted it. Uh, certainly the time spent as, as a junior NCO and, and as a senior NCO was very, very beneficial to me as uh, becoming a junior officer along the way. Okay, you were involved in the Guidon presentation in 67. That's correct, yeah. What do you remember about that? 
Well, uh, what I remember was we did a lot of work uh, running back and forth, a lot of parade score work locally, and then on the weekends we were up to uh, uh, Curry Barracks and spent a lot of time on the parade score up in Curry Barracks with some really top-notch uh, regular force NCOs teaching us drill and all the ins and outs of doing a, a Guidon parade. And uh, we worked uh, diligently. We had, uh, I mean, almost every second weekend we were in Calgary uh, up there two days and so forth. And then uh, we were really put a, uh, we were on the parade uh, at the same time as the Calgary Highlanders. They were getting their new colors and we were getting our Guidon. And uh, I remember the day that uh, we actually had the parade and uh, Mother Nature was not kind to us. It was windy, uh, blustery, cloudy, uh, all the elements were being thrown at us, but it worked out really well. There was a, a good attendance of the, uh, pop, of the local people, as well as, I think it was Princess Alexandria uh, mm -hmm. actually presented yes. the colors to both the Highlanders and ourselves. And it was quite a parade, and uh, we looked darn good. I've seen some, some of the video in those days taken, I guess, or maybe eight millimeter camera stuff, I don't know, it was a while back, but it was quite a parade and, and we really worked hard and it was, a, it was a defining moment for the regiment, to say the least. It was the first time we were a Guidon, which was, which was uh, a lot of years ago, but we did a good job. I think uh, Lauren McDonald uh, was the squadron commander, I think it was one of the lieutenants on parade, and, uh, but yeah, I remember the RSM at the time uh, having a very difficult time holding on to the Guidon because of the, uh, the wind. It was very, very high, very blustery day. No, that was the Sergeant Major. Oh, yeah, sir. Uh, Al Arellis, that's yeah. right, that's right. He was the Sergeant Major. Yeah, right. yeah. But it was a great day. So you took your basic officer course in Dundurn, Saskatchewan, I understand. Right. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, your experiences there and maybe well, have a of story or two to go with oh, it? Oh yeah, the uh, Dundurn of course is like, uh, in fact dad, my dad uh, was, was trained in Dundurn during the second war. Anyway, uh, you get up there and of course it's scorching hot in the summertime and it's all sand. And you're living in the old, uh, uh, I guess it'd be brick age huts in those days. And of course, uh, they had a good group of guys that were uh, all uh, keen as mustard, maybe junior officers and so forth. And, and uh, it was my first uh, stint, if you will, uh, from being an NCO, senior NCO, to take my officer training. And it was good, and then it was, uh, again, some of the things you took you'd already taken earlier in your, in your training. But again, a uh, good group of guys uh, from all different branches within the Army. And like I say, scorching hot, uh, and we're out there, you know, punching the parade square, just like I did when we started off as, as recruits and so forth. And then. Uh, and uh, we did weapons training and of course all the basic things that you need to know as a junior officer leading a, uh, a in our, I guess in our, our case it would be a platoon, platoon level training and uh, that sort of thing. And yeah, out on the midnight marches and all that sort of thing and just using all the skills that you acquired and uh, it, was, it was a good deal. And uh, you look at pictures of, of some of the guys you were with and you still remember the names. I mean, we all went through it together. We had. I think most of our instructors at the time were all regular force. I think there was a regular force uh, captain that was the in charge, and then you had regular force artillery and infantry, uh, senior NCOs, and so forth. And they uh, they gave it to us because you know, you're expected to lead men and uh, do it right. And they they didn't mince their words. And it was interesting. It was always uh, you know whatever your name was and whatever rank at that. I guess it'd be officer cadet. Uh, that they, they, they would. And then when we graduated from that course, it was sir after we'd done that. I remember that distinctly. Uh, and they would salute you and so forth. But up until that time, you were an officer cadet, you were really, you know, you're in that zone between not an NCO, you're not an officer, you're in no man's land, if you will, and until you graduated off that course. It was, uh, but at that time when you graduated, you got some certificate, I guess, given to you and a salute and it was sir. So that was, that was gratifying. But we, they worked us hard for four weeks. It was a good, uh, good tough course. I think one of the things I, I remember is shooting the Bren gun, which I had never fired before, uh, but I really enjoyed it. An amazing piece of uh, infantry weapon, uh, just a wonderful weapon to fire. Uh, very, very accurate, in fact, too accurate. But I remember that distinctly out in the ranges and doing quite well with that particular weapon. Yeah, it was a good time. So how old would you have been then when you took that basic officer course? I think I was 18, I believe. Because I don't, I just, uh, I was married at 18, and I'm just, I, I'm pretty sure it was, was 18, yeah, yeah. And, and what were you doing in civilian life for, for work at that time? 
I was working out at Suffield. I uh, started out at the Defense Research Board, Suffield Experimental Station at the time, that's the name of it, and I started there in 66. I'd finished uh, high school in, in July or June, and then two weeks later I was basically starting out at Suffield and spent 40 years at Suffield. So I was in, it worked out really well because you're in uh, the def Defense Department, research-wise, but it also dovetailed nicely with my uh, work in the, within the regiment. Do you think being in the regiment uh, uh, assisted in your getting the job at uh, the I, Defense Department? I don't really think department? so. It had an opp I had a, an opportunity. I had about four jobs accepted that I really wanted to go to Suffield. In fact, I'd already signed on to start as a drafting career for the Medicine and Electrical Department. And then just after that, within days, uh, Suffield came through and said, we have a job offer. So I said, well, I had to cancel the work with the city and started out at Suffield. But I, I don't think it was just that the, uh, there was four of us that they took out of high school and basically started a, off on on-job training right out at the research station. And uh, I stayed on, I remember the, uh, uh, three of the fellows, one ended up being the fire chief eventually in his career and the other two uh, left Suffield, but I was still there for 40 years. And, and certainly, the training that I had in the, in the reserve regiment here definitely helped me out a lot in, in my work out at Suffield, a lot. And open doors for me. Uh, you, could, you could look at what you were doing and you're, you're keeping abreast of what some of the issues and items that were needed for the forces and so forth. And you could actually be tied in with developing some of the items out at Suffield that the forces were looking at. So it really, the, the whole career really dovetailed nicely together. So what is, do you have some... I know that some of the things you're probably not able to talk about, but some of the things that, that, were, that stick out of your mind is really interesting work that you had an opportunity to be involved in out at Suffield oh, in your career. good grief. I, I started off in what they call the shock and blast department, which was a study of uh, nuclear blast phenomena. Uh, and you went from uh, work in, in what's called shock tubes, which were uh, compressed air being put down a, an instrumented uh, uh, cylindrical pipe, if you will, and testing uh, um, models and so forth. And then you had tied in with high-speed photography. And then you took that information and actually went out into the field and got involved with some of the big trials that we did out at Suffield, you know, 600-ton uh, trials, 500-ton trials, and that sort of thing. So you could actually take it from the laboratory and then get out in the field. So I was in that uh, for quite some time. And there was uh, field trips uh, periodically to different parts of Canada in the United States. And then, I, and then I transferred over to the chemistry section, uh, which was a bit of an eye-opener for me, but it tied in nicely with the, uh, the work with the, that the station was doing in, uh, on, on chemical uh, biological defense mechanisms. And uh, through that, training with both in shock and blast and in chemistry, I, I eventually got a chance to go as a combined, that particular job as what they call a field trials officer. And that combined some of the knowledge that I had acquired in both those departments and later on looking after uh, field trials and, and setting up safety templates and keeping people safe and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but as far as highlights in my career, gosh, uh, there it just so many different uh, aspects of the work I got involved with. One of the big things was uh, it, when I was as a field trials officer looking after supervision of a lot of the chemical cleanup that was left over from the Second War. Uh, a lot of the stuff had been stockpiled and so forth and needed to be rendered safe and gotten rid of. Uh, and that was gratifying in, in the sense that uh, getting that stuff cleaned up and, and cleaning up the environment as well. And that, well, that was a big project and, and very important and Canada really pushed it and, and getting it cleaned up. So that was a highlight. And then some of the trips to, uh, I went up to Inuvik. Uh, we were doing some permafrost blasting for a, a major out of Queen's University. And he was doing a thesis on that. And we went up there and, and uh, left Medicine Hat here at about, uh, oh, must have been 10 above got to Edmonton, it was 10 below, got the Yellowknife, it was 20 below, and got up the Anuvik, it was 40 below. And it was like that the entire week. So that was an interesting working in that environment. And then we did work over in Gagetown, uh, New Brunswick, uh, on, the, on the Leopard tank, on the NBC packages, on the particular tank and subjecting it to simulants, if you will. And then down to uh, places in uh, Me uh, Co uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, we did a big 500 ton trial down there. And then a couple of years later, another 500-ton trial down in Socorro, New Mexico, and, and, and that sort of thing. So really a varied career that I had. And we did some work off the, uh, the west coast of uh, Vancouver, or British Columbia, off Vancouver Island, where we did some, uh, we set off a 
2,000 pound charge under the water and that was tying into some work that was being done out at Halifax on the new destroyers that Canada had bought and they were subjecting the destroyers to uh, underwater blast and seeing uh, what would happen perhaps to uh, the ship's uh, hulls and so forth. So, I mean, there wasn't much that I didn't do out there that, uh, in some capacity that uh, I was involved in. So it was just a great place to work, really, really good people, interesting uh, challenges and technology and so forth. So, What do you remember about the changes from armored to reconnaissance in the... Uh in the South Alberta Light Horse. Well, I remember the, uh, we were, and it was funny how that happened because uh, we were off to summer camp in Wainwright and the tanks and stuff were still here. And we came back in, the, in September and they were gone. I mean, we didn't even have a chance to say goodbye to our, our, we had eight Sherman tanks here and they were gone. We didn't even have a roll past or give them a hug and send them on their way, that type of thing, you know, being tank soldiers. And then uh, we switched over to reconnaissance which was uh, utilization of, of the uh, Jeeps. And some of the Jeeps were getting well up in age and then over a period of, of time. And it, the whole concept, of course, is different when you're, when you're fighting armored. You're, uh, you know, you're out there with the infantry uh, in support or that, whatever, infantry combat teams and, and armored combat teams. But going in reconnaissance, of course, you're out there well ahead of those groups trying to find your enemy making contact with them, sending back your reports and so forth. It, bit, it was quite a bit of a transition. So then, you know, you just became more acutely aware of, of using the terrain and so forth that you're, you're actually training in, use of ground and all that sort of thing. And it was, um, it was a bit of a blow for us losing the tanks and stuff because it was, uh, it was it, you got a bit of a, uh, they were kind of exciting to be working with and so forth. They were, they were kind of fun. And then they took the tanks away, as I say, and then uh, you're into reconnaissance. We thought it was a step backward, but, um, but in the reconnaissance role, it's definitely challenging, whether you're vehicle mounted or on your flat feet or whatever. Reconnaissance work can be very, very interesting and challenging and exciting. What do you, uh, I remember being up in Wainwright when you were the squadron commander. Oh, yeah. With uh, Major Dick Lawrence from yep. the Strathconus. Yeah. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Bob. No, uh, do you have any uh, memories of that? Do or? I ever, yeah. because we were, we had, I think, you were there. You were the, uh, I think you were the sergeant major for the squadron, seems that to me. Was a warrant officer were you a warrant, warrant officer yeah. then? Anyway, uh, we had so many troops under command, and our frontage was so wide that the troops on the right hand side couldn't, under, couldn't hear the, tr the troops on the left hand side. So, what we had to do, we had to designate airtime. Or the, in my command post, you'd pass on, became like a message center, if you will, because we were so spread out. And then that advanced the contact exercise, and it was in, it seems to me it was, it was outside the, the actual camp. And we were moving into the, some of the, the rural areas, if you will, and, and it was a big, a big frontage and a, and a big, uh, big 72-hour exercise. And it was, uh, it was a challenge, to say the least. And uh, yeah, you learned a lot of things in a hurry. One of, the, one of the things that I liked in those days, there was great cooperation between the uh, regular force and the reserves. Because regular force, that's their bread and butter, they do that for a living. So the reservists were coming up and they had a chance to learn a lot from the regular force people. And they took the time to uh, teach the reservists. And it was great because I could work with, say, a battle captain. I was a captain or a squadron commander. I was a you know, squadron commander, that type of thing. So you were right there working with these guys. And if you had difficulties or needed things clarified and so forth, the expertise was right there. And the rapport between the regulars and the reserve was just excellent. Um, and uh, it, it was, they couldn't do enough for you. And we were up there for a week and it was very intensive training. So that whole week was, was, uh, was time well spent. Yeah. And, and we established really, really good contacts with the, uh, the regular force people. There was a lot of uh, mutual uh, uh, training and, and appreciation for each group. And, and they understood that we're part-timers, if you will, and trying to do the best that we could with, with some of the equipment that was not in, in all that uh, great shape and so forth. But it did work out. And they, they, uh, they appreciated us. And of course, that carried on into the Afghan conflict in places like Bosnia and all that type of thing. Reservists uh, became more and more involved in that sort of thing. Uh, so that was, you know, it was it, along the way, it, they learned and we learned. But there was a time in that uh, particular transition where uh, the reserves were somewhat marginalized from the regular force when uh, they were training with completely different equipment. Uh, yeah, exactly. You're right, and and uh, we were the poor boys, if you will. We got the cast off some of the, uh, the regular. In fact, there was purchases made um, for.
for the reserves that it ended up the regular force getting them before the, the re reserves did. So that was kind of a blow. But yeah, the, the difference in equipment was quite remarkable. We'd be working here with, with Jeeps and so forth that were, you know, held together as best we could. Then you would transition into the field and you had your uh, Lynx vehicles, which are tracked, some of the 113 APCs and so forth. And I think even, I think we even had some Centurion tanks involved when we had the uh, troops set up where you had, uh, each troop had uh, two tanks and I think it was five other vehicles and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But yeah, they're all along the way. But uh, we were always uh, getting the short end of the stick in, in, in many respects. So as, as you progressed um, with the regiment, when you hit the, ma the, the major role, how did your, how did your work, day-to-day uh, -day work change? Uh, here at the regiment? Well, of course, you end up doing a lot more paperwork and staff work because you're looking after a squadron. And then setting up your, uh, your training plans and so forth, uh, you, utilizing your, the people that you got under your command, and then making sure that the work got done, and then trying to keep it as interesting as is possible to maintain uh, a speed of corps, if you will, and the morale of the troops, uh, and so forth. And you were uh, you know, planning your, your, your training uh, as the seasons changed, if you were. You wanted to get out in the wintertime and do a basic winter warfare and, and survival and stuff, and those, those are interesting times, to say the least. And then in the summertime, you were taking your course, or during the September to June, you are working up uh, training and so forth to then get them in the field during the summer. And, and use some of this stuff. And, and uh, it was, as a major, then of course you're dealing with uh, the problems that come with command uh, at the different levels and so forth, issues with uh, people within the troops and so forth, and uh, disciplinary matters. Uh, you're very, very concerned about all the things that you're, you're leading the men uh, and to trying to do the best for them and so forth, which is always the most important thing about leadership. And uh, just, uh, it, it became more and more of a challenge because as a lieutenant, you're looking after a troop, captain looking after uh, a couple of troops, maybe you might be the battle captain or the operations officer. When you're the squadron commander, then of course you're looking after those people come under your command and you're trying to keep them happy, they're trying to keep you happy, and uh, that sort of thing. So it's a challenge, but it was, uh, it was you worked at it and, and you honed your skills and you're open to uh, suggestions and ideas and that, and that type of thing. So that's, I was always open to, uh, to my, the people that I commanded and, and that sort of thing. I think there's a lot of concerns. You're dealing with the quite a spectrum of, of people, if you will, different ages and, and so forth. Yeah. You alluded to uh, the change of roles when it went from armored to armored recce. Did, was there a lot of work involved in actually having to retrain and, and, and come up with training plans uh, to, to accommodate the new role? Oh yeah, you had to go right back to square one again because there's quite a distinct difference between your armored training and reconnaissance, and basically everybody had to go back, and we're talking at the lowest level of, uh, of a trooper, right up to your squadron commanders and beyond. The whole concept of reconnaissance training is different, so you went back, everybody had to go back to square one again, and then learn your different skills at the different, uh, uh, different rank levels and so forth. Yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, some of the stuff is quite common, whether it's uh, an armored uh, troop sergeant or an armored reconnaissance sergeant, uh, that sort of thing. Those basic skills about leadership are, are, remain the same. It's the tactics and so forth that change so much and your whole way of thinking and doing things. So it was a, it was a learning process for everybody. I think even from yeah. when, when Robert, when he was commanding officer, right from the top down, everybody had to learn. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, is there anything that sticks out particularly in your mind about uh, any particular incident that uh, or uh, uh, involvement in the regiment during your time that sort of is a highlight? Well, that's, yeah, there's lots of different highlights. It's just, you know, it, uh, you had your highs and lows, of course, and uh, getting your, um, you know, getting your, the, the, the guide on for the regiment, um, attending different uh, major exercises and so forth, and being able to command the squadron and so forth, which was good. Um, yeah, and then, uh, like I say, the whole spectrum associated with training and, and being a reservist, uh, it's just, uh, you, you stand back sometimes, you go, man, we accomplished a lot in the 32 years that I was with the regiment, and the things you did, it's, it's you know, there's, there's, like I say, there's nothing that really jumps out at me as far as, as uh, one thing over the other. Um, like I say, just, just the training was so doggone interesting and, and fun. 
Uh, and again, there was lots of time where, you, you know, weekend after weekend, you were gone. And it was, you had to really try and balance it out as best you could with your family and, and, and uh, have their support and so forth. And some, some weekends, it was, it was uh, you were gone two or three weekends in a row, and that can be, can be hard on a married man and, and uh, that type of thing. So you had to really be careful. And in fact, uh, I, I stopped training or being the regiment in 1980. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I stopped, uh, took five years off. I figured, well, my, my children um, were hitting their teens. And I thought, well, if I spend way too much time at my reserve training, I'm going to miss their time as uh, teenagers. So I, uh, I took the five years off. And I wasn't sure whether they going to come back or not. But I, as they got into their late teens, of course, less time for mom and dad. So I decided to come back in. And uh, it was f five years later, I came back in the spring of 85. I went back to my desk in my office, right, which was uh, same location, if you will. I opened up my drawers, and there was paperwork still needing to be done that I had left in advance. And I said to, might have been Robert, I remember who was CEO at the time, but I came, I said, I wonder if they still want this staff paperwork done. And he said, probably not. But I found it hilarious that it, after having been gone for five years, the paperwork was still there in my desk. So I just, I just continued on, yeah. You served as DCO for a number of years, Deputy Commanding Officer or 2IC. Right. I think it was 75 that they promoted me to Major. And uh, up until 1980, I was still a Major, and I came back in 85 as a Major and stayed there until uh, 2000. So, uh, like Robert has said, you're probably the longest serving Major in the Canadian Forces. But I enjoyed it. It was good. Yeah biggest thing you saw after, after five years of being away like you saw, there some that was a similarity where it was like some of the stuff is still here but the equipment must have changed in that five-year period well I was uh, always you know interested in what was going on with the regiment and I'd drop in and you know pe see people and so forth and I kept you always keep in touch with your your army buddies and I guess what struck me the most was that we had gotten away of this cooperation between the uh, regular force and the reserves it ended up that the reserves took it upon themselves to train their own people. And uh, we still had regular force support in some capacity, but they were treat, uh, teaching themselves. And I, th I thought it was, uh, and I thought it was a mistake, and I still do, at the time of not taking advantage of the skills that the regular force people had, because there was things that, as reservists, you just don't uh, learn that well as regular force people do. But again, it was, uh, that's what I noticed the most, that reserves were teaching themselves. And that was quite a change for me, because, uh, it was just the different concept. Yeah. I'm curious about the Iltis. When did that come into being? Oh, man. I, I can't remember, Robert. We had those old 74 pattern jobbies, and then we had uh, the Iltis came in. Then we had CJ7s. CJ7s, and, yeah. Uh, the commercial pattern Jeep that had an upgraded uh, electrical system. True, yeah. And then uh, the Iltis came in, and I remember they arrived, and we couldn't use them for a year. Yeah, we just had them sh shipped to the regiment, and they sat. And I can't remember what the reason was. They we couldn't, just... uh, uh, well, they wouldn't run courses. Right. And then uh, there was something to do with warranties, so they made sure they were off warranty before <laughs> we got to use them. <laughs> it was a pretty crazy <laughs> time on how, you know, the equipment finally did arrive, and it was going to be as new as you could get, if you will, for the reserves, and we were pretty happy about it. But like Robert said, they sat for a year before whatever needed to be put in place to, to operate. The was not that good a vehicle no, uh, no, for it reconnaissance. It was uh, didn't it stand was, up uh, well in the field. A, a vehicle that was made in uh, Germany. It was made in Germany for the German situation, which they ran a lot on roads. Yeah, and then we took them out to the field, and they just did not stand up. I mean, as far as good equipment goes, the stuff that came out of the Second World War in Korea was indestructible, and we ran it for years and years and years. It was just so well made. And then as those things got worn out and new stuff brought on board, some of the new stuff was just not up to snuff. Especially the three-quarter ton. Three-quarter ton was just indestructible. That was a good piece of kit and the deuce and halves and that sort of thing. And, and uh, really, we haven't really learned as we've gone along because some of the more modern things just have not met the, uh, the long life that those vehicles had. They're very maintenance intensive. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And then when it went to commercial stuff uh, and then uh, militarized them, that was, it was a, it was a stopgap, if you will. And it worked, but it was not, they didn't stamp, stand up either in the field. So it was a lot of, 
broken vehicles and a lot of maintenance problems and so forth. So it, it was a real challenger for, for the people that did the maintenance work to keep some stuff going that was, uh, yeah, it was just no end to it. Yeah. Then you would have been involved also then when, because it went, you went from Armored to Armored Recce and then it reverted back again to Armored at some point. I don't that know. That was, uh, uh, yes. Oh, with the Cougars. In, uh, when I was in, uh, we had B Squadron was Armored. Yeah. We were reconnaissance down here. That's correct. And then in, uh, I think, uh, the early, ni about 93, they decided to convert the regiment to all Armored. Yeah. So that was a big challenge. That's right, because you had two different doctrines being <laughs> in the same regiment. And mind you, it wasn't bad when it was armored reconnaissance because you, you could have your Cougar vehicles, which were tank trainers, if you will, would augment your uh, reconnaissance troops and you could actually have a, uh, a reconnaissance troop with a couple of uh, tank trainers, if you will, armored reconnaissance. And like I say, then Robert had mentioned, we went to uh, Cougars and there wasn't a lot of those things going around, but uh, a limited amount of ammunition. But it, it was a transition period again that we adapted to, went back to armored tactics again and then uh, went through that phase and went back to reconnaissance again, which they are today. And what, uh, what frustrations did you experience during the, uh, your time in? Uh, is there a couple that stick well, out? Well, I, I think the main thing was that you were, you were given the challenge to train your regiment or your squadron, and you know there was all sorts of great ideas by the higher-ups, if you will, to get on with the job and make it interesting. What I found frustrating, you would come up with training plans that had to be approved by the higher headquarters, and a lot of times they would say, no, you can't do that. And it was really, really frustrating because you would go to great lengths to come up with interesting training for the soldiers and so forth to keep them engaged and their morale high. Uh, and then you get this frustrating but it being turned off by the higher headquarters. That's, that's probably one of the reasons that I didn't take my, command, my courses for becoming commander officer. I, I felt that the, there was, they were just restricting uh, in a lot of areas, uh, the commanding officer's ability to command their regiments. And I found that extremely frustrating. Other than that, it was the usual stuff that, you're, that you, you, you go with. with uh, recruiting was Recruiting was always there. a nightmare, always a nightmare, yeah. getting guys on stand. One of the, we, and we'd have British soldiers that would show up uh, that were you know, uh, part of the baddest training and they were getting out of the British uh, forces um, and trying to get them on, on strength yeah. for the Canadian forces. It was just yeah. a nightmare. We had yeah. a lot come in, and then uh, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau made that requirement that they had to be Canadian citizens. Exactly, but then we found that frustrating because yeah. you know we're part of NATO, part of the Commonwealth country, and here they're they're trained better, if not uh, better, in many many cases than we as reservists were, and they were a godsend because you needed good qualified junior NCOs and senior NCOs and that type of thing, and it was just a real big headache trying to getting them in. And then, and then they, they, they would take them, say, well, okay, Sergeant Bloggins from such and such regiment in the British Army, you can come on board, but we're going to demote you to corporal. Well, you know how that went over. That didn't go over very well at all. But we did pick up some pretty darn good uh, British NCO to put up with the, the uh, frustration of getting them on strength. Things changed a little bit for the better, but, it, but we did get some, some darn good NCOs. Uh, well, I and remember one specifically is uh, Tony Batty. Yep. Yeah. He ended up joining the uh, Strathconas, Came the regular force, yeah. and he's, I think he's still RSF. I, th I think you're right, Bob. So they did come yeah. through the reserve system. Uh, they liked the military, got out of the British forces in this case, and then you know, went and joined the Canadian forces in, in armored regiment and did quite well. So uh, that has worked out, but again, it, it's still, and I think it's still a bit of a bone of contention too, getting new recruits into the regiment. It's a real long, dragged-out process, and I find it uh, interesting in the set that with all the technology that we have available on speeding things up, uh, you know, getting medicals done and security clearances and all that type of thing that the, that the new soldier needs, very, very time-consuming. Yeah. Well, it's uh, a lot of times it's six months. Yeah, which is ridiculous when you really think about it. You're going to lose people. You can't give a person a job within a couple of, uh, say, a month or a month and a half. You've lost them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, then I got, when I was out, or I have been out in the regiment, I get involved with uh, the regimental association. I uh, look after membership in this neck of the woods, sort of Calgary South, of uh, former members of the regiment and friends of the regiment. And we've got about 120? 120, 130? 130 members in the association. And prior to that, we had a couple of associations that way 
go back years, which were good ideas, but they weren't terribly successful. And I think the one we have this time around has been really successful and doing very, very well. And you uh, went on a Battlefield tour in 2013. I know I went on one in 2007. What do you remember from the Battlefield tour? Well, it was a, a great experience, and I'm glad I went. My younger brother, Reed, went as well because of all the things you read uh, history-wise, uh, military-wise, um, getting over there and then, uh, you, you know, uh, you just come across these uh, cemeteries that just stagger you, you know, when you consider the, 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 the hideousness and the horror of war, until you actually see the number of headstones and so forth. It just, it just, um, just drives it to you as far as, you know, the shock of it all. But, but going through the different countries, we, um, we went and landed in Amsterdam and then made our way from uh, Holland down through Belgium and ended up in France. But as the story goes, we got to uh, Bergen op Zoom and Don, you were there. And the whole experience was just amazing, the people in, in the Netherlands. Uh, they just can't do enough for you. And then going over the same ground that you know that the South Alberta Regiment had done during the Second War, um, it was just uh, amazing. And, and uh, going to places that you, know, you actually see photographs and you're, like you're right there, the, you know, some 70 years later. And then even the, the looking at the, uh, the First World War and, and that set up, and you, you, you think it covered a great big, huge piece of land mass, and it really didn't. And then the, the awfulness of the, the things that happened there. But again, visiting these places, and Europe is just covered in these, all over the places, these cemeteries, where it's Second World War or, or First War, or just whatever. Uh, I, I remember same thing, being shocked at the size, like the Hawkwald, which is on our battle honors. Yep. I mean, it's a, something you don't even have to move your head to see around. Precisely. It's, and, and it's quite a small area. Yeah, and you, and you read about that particular battle and what happened there, uh, and you go, really? You know, it just takes you back. Like when we were at the Tynecott uh, Cemetery, and you're looking at 10,000 headstones in this particular... Uh, Here to Tynecott, it's 37,000. Uh, probably, yes, it's amazing, the number of, you and know... And then uh, 73,000 listed on the walls yeah, or at, something? Yeah, uh, at the Menin Gate. Yeah. And that, and that. So, so we're going to go back again in 2016. Uh, I believe there's 106 people... 103. 103 going this time, so it'll be... Uh, it's really escalated. And I've convinced my wife to come along with me, and my brother's coming out again, and so we're looking forward to it. And we're going to be going... Uh, Calgary to Paris, that at Caen, and then work our way up the, the route that the South Alberta Regiment took during the Second War and finishing up in Germany. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll get to the Hawkwell this time around. But it was a great experience, and, and if I, I recommend that anybody gets a chance to get over to the European battlefields and see it at least once in your lifetime. It's, it, it's time well spent because it's just, um, it just takes you back uh, of what our, our, our fathers and grandfathers and so forth went through. You know. One of the amazing things I remember is Falais. Mm -hmm. You you get a picture down that main street, and the, most of the buildings are still there, and there's very few that have been added. Precisely, we were Don and, and I were there yeah. at Saint Lambert, and uh, just you look at the the lay of the land, and you go, and you picture in your mind's eye what's happening there, uh, and you go, holy Mackinac, and then yeah. and you and you go walking right down in that little town, and like you say, the buildings are all the same. Uh, some have been repaired because you saw pictures of some of the what, what had been da damaged during the Second yeah. War and so forth. And the people, uh, we don't speak the same language. They loved to see us. They, they had a nice dinner set up for us. And of course, what was that stuff that we had? A that uh, Kavasi. It, it was a, an apple type uh, liqueur. Kibasi, yeah. And man, a couple yeah. of those things you could feel it. But really yeah. good, uh, nice people. And, and uh, as I said, but hasn't changed in 70 years. No. You know, amazing. Yeah. What amazed me, and I, I don't know know how you felt about it, but I was absolutely astounded at the reception that the people gave us in terms of hosting us, saying, you know, like, we're glad you've come. Yep. And the way they treated us was, um, they treated us like kings and royalty. Yeah, really, and I, I, I thought. You, you take lots of pictures and you get back and get those printed and you want to take and mark the back of the photos because you forget as to what what the occasion was. but. The, the whole experience was just, just amazing and, and didn't matter where we went. Uh, and the, some of the veterans that have uh, they've taken and they've done themselves up in period uniforms and the equipment has all been re re restored and that, and they use those in those parades. And, and it's just great, as I say, that people, just the, the appreciativeness, I think, all of the European people on the, on the, on the different places that the, the regiment liberated and so forth.
I mean, that reception of Bergenob's Zoom was just unbelievable. Yeah, just incredible. So time well spent. Yeah, I'm do it again. And like I say, I talked to my wife, Sharon, and I said, you got to come along, dear, because I said, you know, may never do this again in your lifetime, but it gives you a chance to see some of Europe and meet these wonderful people and see these places. So that'll be part of our 50th wedding anniversary, by the way. <laughs> so. Well, that's going to be good. Yeah. My wife's has agreed to come as well. So That's right. That'll be great it's, for it's them. It's going to be really, uh, really a fabulous experience. Yeah. Is there anything else before we uh, end, uh, Paul? Well, I, I think the, like uh, the sort of cut you off, Bob, but uh, things that you get involved with because of the time you spent in the reserves and in the army, it's in your blood. Mm -hmm. So when you take time off, uh, you know, you get involved with the regimental museum, the regimental association, uh, the institute that you and like you, you alluded to in your interview uh, between the two of us is almost 20 years as, as the institute presidents. I was happy to uh, see the institute get the royal title here about a year, about a year ago, I guess, from Her Majesty. Um, and we've, we've kept that institute going for like 27 years. Uh, John Reynolds at that time was a, a retired uh, British major, got it going with about, I think, eight or nine of us, Bob. And now we're up to around 65, 70 members. Uh, we get really, really good uh, guest speakers. Uh, and uh, like I say, it's, it's time well spent. The things you learn, even from the people that are members, you can draw, some of them are historians. I'm, I'm thinking of Matt Klamashinsky there and his skills, at, and he's a historian and a great speaker. But, and, and, and the proximity that we are near Suffield, you know, you're getting top-notch uh, military people coming through. Uh, at the base, uh, British, Canadian, defense scientists, and so forth. So we've been really lucky uh, with our institute down here. Like I said, we get re a, really a, a broad spectrum of guest speakers. It's just phenomenal. And uh, it's been very gratifying, as I say, and it's, it we con continues to go, and we'll keep it going. Uh, where other institutes in ca Canada have folded up, we're, we're maintaining our own, and it's, it's, it's time well spent. Yeah. Well, it's good to see that you're involved in these organizations, and we, we parallel on, on several of them. Yes, indeed. Um, and, and I think it's important, I don't, I, because I don't know that Canadians really appreciate uh, uh, what the soldiers have done and what they continue to do, both within our country and abroad. And the Battlefield Tour certainly cemented it for me as to the sacrifices uh, and, uh, and what the people felt about the sacrifices. Very much so. And it's, you know. um, as I say, it'll, and I'll continue to do it and probably until I'm ready to go six feet under, in the sense in some capacity somewhere to help out the regiment, because uh, it's very important, and uh, it's just part of your life. Well, we've had ex-commanding officers. Doug Heine is one that sticks in my mind. He's still involved. Yes, he sure and, is. Uh, yeah. He's in his uh, late 80s. Yeah, and uh, it just, uh, it's just something to do, and it's so very important, uh, particularly uh, the young people coming on board, and to maintain the history of the regiment and make sure it's going and make sure that the government's aware of, of the importance of the Reserve Army. I mean, look at our, our new Minister of Defense, yeah. uh, reservist, a Lieutenant Colonel. I guess he's got to step back in that job. And, uh, and, but again, uh, you know, those things that you, you never thought would happen. But now we're seeing that because uh, at one, you know, one time it was a we-they thing with the um, Army. Uh, now it's very cohesive uh, with the reserves and the, and the uh, regular force, particularly with the last conflict in Afghanistan. I think a third to a half of the of soldiers over there were reservists. Yeah. You know? But it's, it's interesting, though, uh, that was true when we were involved, but uh, the political situation and the budgetary situations and that uh, suck back and, uh, and uh, sort of starting to uh, affect us. You can take a look at it on how they... Uh, encourage the reserves. Yes. Which yes. they're not doing now. That's exactly right. And of course, with the Afghan war going on, uh, th there was very much a lot of emphasis uh, financially and so forth on what the soldiers need. As soon as that conflict is finished, then there's a cutback on defense spending, and of course, it trickles down to the reserves, and they end up getting, a, 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 I always say, a bit of a short end of the stick, if you will, money wise. And then they have to cut back on training and equipment and everything else. So it, it it has peaks and valleys, and it's always been that way. Yeah. Uh, and I guess it probably will continue to be that way. It goes somewhat cyclical. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then we had the disasters here in the city with the, with the floods and so forth that the, the regiment responded to, and, and thank goodness that they did because it was a pretty r critical situation. And they were boots on the ground. 
and needed to be there to, to, to help out until the regulars showed up and augmented them. So it was, the reserves are an extremely valuable institution to have within a community. And uh, that's why it's so important to keep, uh, keep them going and keep them vital. So I think you've, you've touched on the training that you got and, and you said how beneficial some of it was to your own job. And I think that transitions to any reservist that comes in this. He's going to learn skills here that he will apply and make him a better citizen, make him more employable uh, and valuable within the community. Absolutely. The, uh, just the, the right from the get-go when you start out, uh, about doing things and being put in, uh, uh, doing them well, thinking them through at the very young age, and then when you get into different levels of command, uh, having to assess a situation, come up with a plan, and uh, it's just, it ties in beautifully with what you're doing in your civilian jobs and so forth. It's just the skill, and you can't put a price on that. Uh, it just becomes uh, it's second nature on dealing with problems and, and uh, living away from home, living with other people. You're on your own, mom and dad aren't there, you gotta look after keep a uniform all nice and neat and tidy and all that kind of stuff that, that pays off. And I know I was married very, very young um, and really uh, I didn't find being married, you know, that young a, a challenge because I'd been away from probably age 13 through to at least 18 every summer or training somewhere. So when that part of my life came up as a bit of a challenge, I just say, well, get on with it. And uh, you could use it, you could draw on those skills and I use that all through my career to be able to fall back on and say, okay, here's a situation, think it through, come up with a plan and, and make the darn thing work. So yeah, and those are all the things that I learned within reserve force training. It was just very, very valuable in my civilian job and just in my way of life and continues to be that. And of course, the people that you meet along the way and friends and so forth and associates, it's just amazing that that common bond being in the military, uh, you just bump into people all over the place and of course, how you doing? Gosh, it's been a while since I've seen you. You know that you're concerned about them because uh, you've spent time with them and that. So, it, it, great, great benefits. Well, you've certainly uh, given us a good cross section of your your expertise and and your experiences within the regiment and uh, how it's affected you. And I think part of that this could be almost a recruiting a recruiting. Uh, a moment for uh, so. young people that are out yeah. there that you know there is that the reserves do offer uh, tremendous training opportunities that um, will stead you well um, throughout your life and uh, you've certainly shown that and proven it and I thank you very much for taking the time to uh, talk with us today about your experiences and your life it's important that we are able to um, uh, record this for posterity right. and Thank you very much indeed, and thank you, Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure to, uh, to just be able to sit down and talk about these things that you've done in your life, and uh, as I say, it's just been time well spent, as they say. Thank you. So this is another segment of Alberta's Regiment, the, the uh, stories of the South Alberta Light Horse. Thanks for watching. <laughs>